Good afternoon. I might uh, just take a moment to ask you if you can check and double check to make sure your device is silenced right now. And uh, though you might see me refer to my device every so often during this conversation, I'm checking the time and not my uh, Facebook. So just so you know, <laughs> I'll be uh, watching our time today. So my name is Lot Hill. I am the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning at the University of the Pacific. And I'm actually a stand-in for uh, the moderator you may have been expecting today, Dia Penning, uh, was not able to join us today and she sends her regrets. Um, Dia and I work with an organization that is called World Trust out of Oakland, uh, California. And uh, World Trust essentially works with film-based dialogue, uh, creates programs and learning tools that uh, are ultimately that explore systematic racism and uh, racial inequity and that facilitate change in local communities and organizations and real life. So Dia is not able to join us today, uh, but I am very grateful to be here with you today. I'm going to introduce our three panelists. Uh, and we do have three panelists today and not four. Uh, the fourth panelist, Kristen Belden, also was not able to join us due to unforeseen circumstances. Our panelists today include Lilia Luciano, who has directed a feature HBO documentary on Latin America, uh, is an ABC 10 investigative reporter, and she has also covered a number of high-profile news stories reported for NBC Nightly News, The Today Show, MSNBC, The Weather Channel, CNBC, and Telemundo. She has also worked as a host on several Vice platforms. In 2013, she received a GLAAD Award for her Huffington Post column about homophobia in the media. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kim Nalder is the executive director of the Cal Speaks Survey and the founding director of the Project for an Informed Electorate, both programs of the Institute for Social Research at Sacramento State. Her current and recent research is on misinformation, voter knowledge, fact checking, and fake news. Welcome, Professor Nalder. Thank you. And finally, last but not least, we have Chris Nichols. Chris is the PolitiFact California reporter for the Capital Public Radio. For the past 12 years, Chris has worked as a government and politics reporter at newspapers across California. Most recently, he covered the Capitol for the San Diego Union Tribune, and previously he worked at the North County Times in Escondido, the Lodi News Sentinel, and the Sonora Union Democrat. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. All right. So to get us going here, uh, Professor Nalder, would you kick us off perhaps by helping us understand what we're here to talk about, defining fake news? Great. I'm happy to do so. So I see some of you have filled out your white sheets and are still holding them. So if we could get people to come through and grab them and pass them to the center, please. Thank you so much. Okay, so, so fake news, uh, it's a term that we hear all the time, it's something that we hear politicians say, it's something that's bandied about, and so I wanted to define our terms for today, so that at least you know where I'm coming from when I'm talking about fake news and the definition that I'm using, different people might have different definitions. So in speaking about fake news, the definition that academics in general would use is uh, stories that are manufactured out of whole cloth that are false or misleading and intended to mislead generally. So we see two main sources of those sorts of fake stories. One would be people just trying to make money by um, clickbait, right? So, so if you put out a fake news story and it ends up getting shared and clicked on uh, in social media and so forth, you can make a lot of money and in fact there are uh, you know, sort of factories for it in Macedonia where people have learned that you can make all kinds of money uh, by enticing us uh, through political stories in particular, right? We have this emotional connection to our political points of view and so it's, it's very easy to get people to click on those fake stories. And another f source for that sort of fake news that's truly manufactured is of course um, the Russian attempts to influence our elections. 
And this happened as our, um, uh, inter uh, our services within the United States have determined quite um, conclusively that Russia did interfere in our election. But it's not just us, it's other democracies that have been targeted in that same way. So they'll create fake news, put it out there into the world in order to try to undermine our democracy, essentially. So, you know, different sort of sources for fake news, but that's what I mean by fake news. What I do not mean by fake news is stories that shed a negative light on political figures. Uh, that's legitimate reporting. Uh, if there are stories that are fact-based and objective, um, but objectionable to political figures, that's not fake news, that's just a story they prefer not to be published because it uh, doesn't look good. So a little more about that, um, we did find out recently that fake ads were put out on fa Facebook during the election and in fact the estimate, most recent estimate is that 126 million people saw those fake ads put out by the Russian attempt to influence our election and that's especially tr striking when you consider that only 129 million people voted in the presidential election. So it's almost one for every single voter in our election. So it's incredibly pervasive. Uh, another thing I wanted to point out before we get started is um, sort of when we're talking about media and press. The First Amendment is in our Constitution because we need watchdogs, we need pe the, the press to be our eyes and ears and to let us know when the government's doing things that are good or bad or, or indifferent. And uh, so we have great media outlets that do that. Traditional media uh, reporters strive for objectivity, it's part of the norm of the profession. But we also have partisan media. So if you think about something like MSNBC or Fox News, they, much of their content may be fact-based, but it comes from a point of view. And then we have this sort of extraneous outsider content that it may be conspiracy theories, and a lot of that is online, um, that is sort of on the farthest extremes. So I wanted to talk next about why we fear fake news and why we believe it. So the problem with fake news, one, is that we believe the individual things in the stories, right? And, we, and, and usually they're gonna demonize people on the other side from us politically. But the bigger problem is what it does to our system. If we start to take in this fake news long enough, it starts to delegitimize the umpires, essentially, right? The people who are uh, reporting honestly on news are delegitimized and we no longer know where to turn to get real information. And that's the real danger to our democracy. What we do know about fake news is that it's very tempting, that it's emotionally appealing and that's why it's great for clickbait. That's why people make money off of it. And that's because of our cognitive biases. So one of our cognitive biases uh, that we're prone to is something called confirmation bias, which is this tendency for us to want to believe information that confirms our own political beliefs. And along with that, there's this tendency to want to not believe information that doesn't, or, or information that's you know, hurtful to our point of view. If you think about that, that's very natural. Uh, there's a reason that the um, first stage of grief is denial. When we hear something that we really don't want to know, we want to push it aside and say it's not real, right? So confirmation bias means that we take in the information that we want, but we also turn away information that we don't and maybe call it fake news, right? Uh, another cognitive bias that I think is really fascinating is called the Dunning-Kruger effect. So the Dunning-Kruger effect is this idea that people who are more skilled and knowledgeable are more likely to be less confident about their skills and knowledge. Now that sounds strange at first, like why would that be the more you know and the better you are at something, the less you think you know or the, better, the less good you think you are? But if you remember being 19, I don't know if anybody remembers being 19, uh, when you were 19, you, you knew everything about the world if you recall. Right, you had it all dialed and figured out, and as you gain more life experience, you realize that your 19-year-old self didn't know what they were talking about. Some of us do, some of us maybe were great then. Uh, and so the Dunning-Kruger effect is part of that. If you think about, I don't know if anybody here has played Guitar Hero, the video game, uh, it gives you the illusion that you know how, that you could be a rock star, right? That you know how to play the guitar because you're playing this video game version of a guitar. But if you actually started to try to play the instrument, you would start to understand how difficult it really is. And so people like scientists who are experts in a field know enough about it to know how much they don't know. 
right? And, and people who know very little know so little they don't know how much there is to know, right? So, so it's both things. People with less knowledge and skill tend to overestimate how much they know, and people with more knowledge and skill tend to underestimate it. And that leads us to question expertise in science. So if you think about, you know, gosh, I know more about global warming than those scientists do. Uh, it's the people who know less who think they know a lot, and they discount the, the actual expertise amongst the scientists. And part of that is because of how science works. Scientists will frame things in conditional terms, right? As far as we know, the evidence points to, they won't be absolute about it because they know that they don't know everything. That's part of how science works. So the Dunning-Kruger effect leads us as a cognitive bias to discount sometimes when people know more than we do, right? And then the third cognitive bias that really uh, is a problem is that it's easy for us to perceive cognitive biases in other people, but not so much in ourselves, right? So we can see when other people are doing it, but if we do it, you know, we know what we're talking about, right, always. And so it's very hard for us to do something like evaluate fake news because we don't think we're prey to it, it's just all those other people who are prey to it, right? So there are some things that we can do to address this. Um, one of the things that we can do is uh, just be conscious, is this, this metacognition, get into a mental habit of questioning your own assumptions, uh, for, uh, into the habit of looking for the other side to a story, um, and being conscious of alternatives. Um, know going in that you want to seek out alternative explanations or alternative points of view, and that leads us to come to better conclusions just as a, a habit of mind. And then another thing that we can do to avoid fake news, well, two things. We can avoid it, and that's pretty hard to do. If you think about, you know, if you're trying to eat in a healthy way, you would, you know, one of the best ways to do it is just not have any junk food in the house, right? So it'd be a lot easier to not fall prey to fake news if we just didn't see any. And, you know, social media companies and news networks can work on that side for us. But the second piece is ourselves. Uh, how can we sort of not be taken in by fake news? The first thing is just attitudinal, that, that idea that we're going to um, look for alternate pieces of information and have a basic awareness that sometimes we may encounter fake news. But then there are also some very specific tips that we can, that I'm going to share with you, some of which you're being handed out in the, in the sheets that you just got, which are just sort of ways that we know that we can detect current fake news. I suspect some of these will not be as useful as it gets better. I don't think fake news is going away. I think people are going to get better and better and more sophisticated at it. But for now, there are a few things. Um, one is, are there multiple sources reporting the same story? If you, if you see some clickbait and it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, and if you start to Google it and find that there's just that one source for it, well, maybe they broke the story and they're the ones that have the story, but most likely that's a hint that it's not real. Another is if you emotionally just really want it to be true or really want it to be false, right, whatever the thing is. Um, that sort of schadenfreude, when, when you, you, you read the headline, you think, ha ha, I knew it. That's probably a hint that it's not a real thing. Um, another is if the, the language is general and vague. So um, reporters are less likely to say things like the mainstream media or the right wing. They are more likely to interview a particular person. So they'll interview a particular senator or a member of Congress or the president instead of generalizing about an entire group. Um, and then looking for support within the story. A good story will have multiple sources from credible organizations. If it's all one-sided, that's, that's a pretty good hint right there that it's just giving you half the story. Another thing that you can do is look at, um, if it's online, uh, there are these spoof sites that look like a real site like abc.com.co is a fake site, right? So if you look at it, you think, oh, it's ABC. It's not ABC, but it looks close enough to fool you. Um, there are also anything that ends in LO is, is suspect. Uh, another thing you can do is look for the about us. Is it, is it a legitimate reporting organization or is it something that just arose recently? That's a good hint. Um, the author, if there's not an author, that may be something. Not all organizations you know, list a byline. 
But if the author's name looks sort of suspicious or made up, that's a good hint. And if you Google their name and there's no sort of professional background with their past reporting in legitimate organizations, that's a good sign. Uh, if it's all caps, that means your uncle Lyle probably sent it to you, right? And, and that's, that's his thing. All caps is, is a hint, as is lots of uh, punctuation, like lots of exclamation points or question marks and exclamation points. Um, mainstream journalists are probably going to uh, do that in their stories. Um, and then making a claim that it's a secret, like we're the only insiders who know this thing, uh, that the rest of them won't tell you this, that's usually a pretty good sign that it's fake news as well. So things we can do is um, check with fact checkers, snopes.com, politifact.com, factcheck.org, uh, the Washington Post fact checker, all those are, are very good and they will you know, uncover that information for us. And then just having a, me a varied me media diet, not relying on the same sources of information uh, is always you know, a best practice for getting to uh, what's good. And then the last thing I would say is, um, if you know of good, valid reporting organizations that you rely on, pay them, subscribe. Uh, you know, subscribe to newspapers, uh, donate money to public radio, uh, support the good, valid news gathering uh, as part of the effort to undermine fake news. Thank you. So I was so excited to get started here. I didn't give you one important piece of information, which is there will be a 30-minute Q&A at the end of our discussion. So you will have the opportunity to ask your questions. But until then, I'll take care of that for us. Um, and I wanted to ask Chris, uh, do you use lots of exclamation points in your stories, in your reporting? We try not to. That's, um, no, that's not a common thing for for reporters, um, completely agree with Kim, that would be a real red flag for, for possibly some fake news. So what's the implication for you as a journalist um, in, in what we're hearing from Kim? Well, I think that, um, I mean, she covered a lot of great, really great tips. Um, I think that she certainly touched on something that we're seeing as journalists. We're trying to figure out not just is a statement false because someone maybe omitted a few facts and um, or maybe unintentionally made a false remark. We're now we're trying to figure out did they intentionally make up, wholeheartedly make up news or, or make up a false claim. That, that leaves us in a difficult position as, as journalists. Um, you know, PolitiFact, which is a, a group that Capital Public Radio has partnered with, uh, we will fact check claims. I would say the majority are claims that uh, we think someone, you know, for political purposes, maybe stretch the truth. It's a lot more difficult for us to come out and get inside somebody's head and say, no, you intentionally made that up. That, that does leave us in a difficult position. Lilia, uh, what is your take on all this? Again, as a journalist and, and the implications and perhaps even any personal experience you've had um, with fake news. <laughs> well, I think... Um as, as um, Kim mentioned, I think it's important to know how to uh, spot an unreliable source, how to detect fake news. It's also important to remember that we are all responsible and complicit in, in sharing fake news. Um, my boyfriend is an attorney, he's brilliant, uh, he's extremely political, and last week he sent me a link about something that was, as Kim said, just too good to be true. And I clicked on the link and I said, I called him immediately and I said, hey, uh, did you actually click on that before sharing it on Facebook? Because it looks like it came from a reputable source, but when you click on it and you look at the address, that reputable source is no longer there on the website it takes you to. So sometimes there's that kind of, you know, you go to one side and, and another one and another one and then it ends up being fake news. I think another uh, important discussion that we should be having is the discussion about relevance. We oftentimes overestimate the meaning of, of a headline or a piece of news. And this is something that I think especially cable news has, has, has gone into the trend of doing. And it's there's this bombshell, there's this big huge piece of news. And then when you actually ask yourself as a consumer, as, as a person in the audience, wait, but how relevant is this? Is this going to put somebody in jail? Is this going to impact uh, the way the world works or my life in particular? 
you start asking those questions, you start doing a little bit of research and you realize that, wait a minute, no, that was just something that was placed as a headline or was you know, shared for the effect of, of generating that emotion in you when, you when you perceive that headline. And we all have to remember that news is a business. And as Kim said, there's a lot of nonprofit business, there's a lot of new subscription models that are very trustworthy and we should support because the business of news and I'm not going to say in which platforms in particular is, is something that's created oftentimes to benefit the bottom line, big corporations, conglomerates. Um, I work at a station that pays a lot of attention, ABC 10, to, at least in, in what I do uh, as an embedded reporter, investigative reporter, to, to weeding out and, and trying to explain and breaking down what does this mean for you. So we all hear about this word, this title, this issue, um, you know, but what, how does that impact my life and how did that come to be? And those are important questions we should be asking ourselves. Perhaps what you're witnessing is not fake news, but it's irrelevant. So it's been said that 2016 was the year of fake news. Uh, and Oxford Dictionaries declared post-truth all right, post-truth as the international word for 2016. I'd like to ask, you know, what is the state of journalism? What is the state of fact-checking? What about facts themselves in a post-truth era? So if you have anything to say about that, I think we'd like to hear it. And also, what does it mean to be a citizen in a post-truth era? Easy, easy answer, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I can jump in. I, I think that there's no doubt in 2016 we saw a, uh, an election where, where facts just simply did not matter, unfortunately, as much as, uh, as they have in the past. I think, um, you know, um, people, a lot of people voted on a motion. Um, I think that's pretty clear. And I think when, when you bring it back to journalism and how do journalists address this, I think we need to be clear in our articles, in our coverage of political candidates, when they are just a simply um, just making things up. We need to not just convey what they say, but convey whether they're being factual in a very clear, direct way. I don't think there's any way around that um, in this day and age. Uh, we have the resources to do it. You can look up facts very quickly on the internet, you still need to do your homework and make sure you're, you're figuring them out correctly. But as journalists, I think it, it's, it's really our responsibility to do that. Um, I don't think we can just sit back and say, well, here's one side, here's the other, and you figure it out. I think we need to, at the very least, figure out whether they're being factual. I think uh, there is a there is a pressure, increased pressure after the election on journalists to fact check and in organizations to do that. I think there's an expectation from from the audience uh, and consumers to to you know hold us to account. Um, we at Tegna, the parent company of ABC10 of KXTV, we have this uh, franchise called Verify. And we grab a, a piece of news and, and we actually show you the process of fact checking. And that's something that you yourself can, can do. Um, we, you know, we base it on public records. Of course, as reporters, we go to the source, we call, um, and we try to provide that for you. And I think that's a result of, of, of that increased pressure. But I think um, you know, it's, it's also, really important to distinguish you know fake news from mistakes being made and i think that that's that's crucial in journalism um, i'm not saying you know have a tolerance for mistakes that that shouldn't be the case but i think we are entering a very dangerous time for journalism for information for truth for history when we have people who label any information any piece of information that they don't like as fake news uh, sometimes an institution, an organization, a news organization will make a mistake. And, you know, the, the more credible ones will do a retraction, will explain where the issue, where the problem started, why their source wasn't reliable. And this comes from the biggest, you know, institutions. Others will, you know, will, will kind of hide it and, and pretend it never happened. And so that lends itself for being labeled fake news. The, the issue that an organization or a journalist made a mistake at some point, and you know, for instance, uh, Rolling Stone had, that, had the false 
uh, campus rape story accusations, and, and that was a big issue. What did they do? They opened up their process and they invited, I'm, I'm not sure if it was Pointer or, or Columbia University, they, they invited prestigious journalistic institutions to tell them where they went wrong. And then they published a retraction including where the process went wrong and what they were gonna do to fix it. Um, on a personal note, I, you know, I, I lost my job at NBC News due to a mistake that was made very low in the kind of food chain of information. And I personally learned a very difficult lesson and so did other journalists who were involved in that. That said, NBC News is not a fake news site. And um, you know, it's, it's very hard to undo the damage that is done when reputable news organizations are blamed for publishing fake news. What that does is it undermines the whole process, it muddies all of journalism and now you know we walk into an era where everybody who hears something they don't like can say that's fake news and we live in these bubbles and you know confirmation bias plays into that where th that's where the post you know fact era comes from or post truth era comes from it's now i heard from somebody i trust and i like a lie and that lie is irrelevant now because you know that's what I want to hear and we all have to be watchful for that because that will determine the world that we live in if you can just slap the word fake news on something that's credible because you don't like it and and jumping off of that you know one of the big concerns I think is that we used to assume that when we say watch what Congress did we would talk about say the tax overhaul and say okay here are the provisions in it here are the um, exemptions that are being eliminated, here's who, who's going to get what percentage tax cut, et cetera. And then we would weigh in on whether that was good or bad, right? We might have different value um, positions as to whether that was advisable or not, or which things we should emphasize or de-emphasize, but we would all agree on the basic um, content, right? And w uh, that helps us when we think about uh, accountability for our elected officials what in a perfect world we watch what they do after they're elected and then we reward or punish when the next election comes up what i'm worried about today is that we won't know what actually happened based on what they did because we'll be told whatever we want to hear by the news sources that we look into and so if that happens we lose the ability to keep our elected officials accountable one other thing that i, I wanted to mention um is I don't know how to fix this uh, in, in the business of news, but you know, going back to what Kim said, just you know, sponsor the, the organizations that you like. We are so spoiled by those headlines. We're so spoiled by entertainment feeling news. Um, news isn't supposed to be fun. <laughs> uh, real news, you know, real in-depth reporting can be, you know, it, it can be shocking because certain events are shocking, but it's not supposed to be exciting and salacious every day. And, you know, as journalists, we are constantly um, pressured by the audience's expectation to make news exciting. And, um, you know, the way that I've kind of worked with that is just bring people along in my exploration of news is, you know, let's go on this, you know, on this uh, scavenger hunt of facts, or let's let's go into what we call, you know, immersive journalism. Let's take you inside and under, you know, the building that fell and all of those things, so that it feels like an immersive kind of like VR experience, like you're there. That is the only solution I, that I can come up with to invite people into the process of gathering information that's relevant, um, or you know, or absorbing information that's relevant. But it's really scary that we all feel the pressure to make it exhilarating because there's this competition. Um, it, it isn't supposed to be as fun as you know, watching the Kardashians. You know? <laughs> well, so according to a 2016 Pew Research uh, Center study, 62% uh, of US adults get their news via social media, right? So we're talking Facebook, Twitter, et cetera here. Um, I think we're already starting to get into some of the implications of this. You know, part of what, what I think about as someone who works with um, college-age students is how to have the conversations about being able to separate what is thrilling, what is entertaining from what actually might be 
real news, right? Um, but if we're getting them, if we're getting the news through the same sources that we're also getting our friends, you know, whatever, selfies, right? So how, how do we make those distinctions? Um, and, and then, you know, what, is, what does this mean for us? Because we're, we're going to continue using social media, right? So how do we, where do we go, I guess, with this? Is that a question? I don't know if that actually be that question that you can answer. I'll say really quickly, your friends are not journalists necessarily. We trust our friends and our family with, you know, our children and we love them and we like their kids' photos, but the fact that they shared something <laughs> doesn't make it true. I think we we all need to perhaps have gained some new skills. I think there's a this is a new age, this is a new way of information coming at us. We're flooded with it. Um, as a journalist, I've been doing this for, for close to 15 years now, and I, I feel like I need to constantly refresh my skill, especially on the digital side. There are uh, stories that come at you on social media uh, now from personalities that are entirely mm -hmm. made up. There have been uh, some news articles recently about these very influential uh, personalities on Twitter that were found to be the creation of foreign entities that uh, use those personalities, create websites for them, biographies for them, to have them spew out divisive information. Uh, that's just not something that I had to deal with 10, 15 years ago when I started in journalism. There was, you, know, you spoke with someone, you could meet with them in person, uh, you could check them out. But now I think we need to find new skills. We can't just go to their profile on social social media and believe what it says. We have to dig deeper. We have to perhaps even dig beyond what might be a fake biography. So I think as journalists, as citizens, we need to, to dive in, find out what skills we need, and get them. It, it's sort of like uh, you hear people say about libraries. Well, you know, they used to be these places where you went to get books or articles of whatever sort, and, and so why are they relevant today? Well, they're relevant today because we, we desperately need people to guide us through the wealth of information that we have, right? We need trusted individuals who know how to sort through the, the you know, overwhelming amount of information that's out there in the world and help us find good sources. And that's, that's really true with news as well, that we need some curators of good content. And we have, you know, fact-checking organizations like Politifact that are trying to help us navigate that world. But I think we're just starting to see the beginning of that developing in our world. Uh, like Chris says, we need to gain additional skills, but I think we also need to gain additional institutions that help lead us to trustworthy information. I am going to just sort of take us back to this this uh, conversation about social media specifically. Um, so apparently. Uh, in 2016, the, there were, there were uh, it has been documented that at least 30,000 fake Facebook accounts um, were connected to the spread of fake news about the French presidential election. Right? So that's at least 30,000 that, that have um, now been connected to the spread of fake news. You know, what what can even be done about that? Uh, uh, and I know that Facebook and Google and others have been addressing the spread of fake news, so are, are they doing enough? Are they doing what they should be doing? I mean, I know that there's definitely efforts on, 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 on those ends. I know that you know, Twitter's doing its share of unverifying certain accounts that are spreading, especially conspiracy theories and, um, and false information. Technology, by nature, I mean, it, it's, it, it accelerates the intelligence exponentially. Uh, it, it takes a while for us to catch up. Um, I think we are increasingly exposed to the phenomenon, and you know, as consumers, we start understanding, oh, okay, you know, those emails that I got that were spam that asked for my bank account, I'm not going to forward that anymore. We learned that. So in the same way, I trust that we learn to question the fake news accounts, the bots, you know, the Twitter uh, fake handles, and, and the Facebook fake news. Um, but I, but I do fear the 
you know, the, the, the encapsulation of opinions and ideas within social media more than the impact of the bots. You know, when we surround ourselves with like-minded people, we tend to, or people who have our exact same opinion, that uh, that reinforces our, you know, that's that's the the, um, the confirmation bias reinforces our ideas. And what we end up doing is we unfriend people who think different, and we unfollow people who express themselves in a way that's not what I like to hear. Um, and I've had that experience with friends who you know will call me just to debate on something, and I'm like. I'm exhausted. I just don't want to debate anymore. And so an extension of that is unfriending people who don't think like us. That I feel is scarier in the long run, closing ourselves away from a certain, you know, diversity of opinion and thought than and same thing with cable and same thing with you know blogs or whatever we expose ourselves to, you know, newspapers. I mean there's people who say that the Washington Post is fake news and it's horrible and I'm just you know gonna stop ever reading their articles. You know, that's that's concerning. I don't know that the bots will have such a long life, like, well, you know, we'll get smarter. I don't know, I think. <laughs> Any quick comments on this? Uh, you know, the internet has been sort of the wild west, historically, and that was fun for a while. But I think this last election cycle has taught us something about the responsibility that they ought to have for our democracy. Uh, the the opportunity for some of them to testify before Congress recently uh, didn't go as well as we would have hoped in that they didn't send the CEOs, they sent the lawyers. And they didn't make big promises about you know what they would do to head this problem off in the future. So you know maybe we need some regulation or some pressure from users or you know whatever it takes. But they they are largely um, the means of transmission of the big news and ought to bear some of the responsibility for that. First, I'm going to ask Chris to uh, just take a, take a sure. shot of the social media question. Sure, I think uh, there's a lot that social media companies still need to do. I, I don't claim to have all the answers for exactly what they should do. I, I do think we should keep in mind that uh, they are profit-driven companies. Um, you know, most media companies are as well, uh, so that we can't forget that. Uh, one small step that they've taken, at least Facebook has taken, is they have partnered with organizations, including PolitiFact, to uh, essentially add disclaimers at the, the bottom of a, a post, a social media post, uh, when, when a story has been fact-checked and found to be false. So that's a small step. Um, I certainly don't think it's the only thing they should do. Um, I think it's an example of something that is, is at least headed in the right direction. So, please, may we have a question? Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to go back like 15 years, like Chris was talking about, and uh, the good professor started out uh, by defining terms, but she used two terms and she skipped right over them was legitimate. So, if you never define what is legitimate news, so I'd like to ask that right now. Well, uh, legitimate journalists are generally trained in journalism with particular norms and expectations for the discipline, which is that they will see, seek out multiple sources, attempt to be as uh, uh, even-handed and fair in their reporting as possible, to um, seek out legit. I mean, we should ask the journalists this very question, but but uh, you know, adhering to the norms of the profession, admitting errors and um, not having a partisan uh, intent in, so in the So would you consider the New York Times legitimate news? Uh, the, so with newspapers, it gets a little bit tricky. The news sections of the newspapers ad adhere to these guidelines, right? So the front page of That's the newspaper, those about. stories, yeah. the editorials and op-eds are opinionated and, and may not meet that standard, of right? Of course. But the front page stories, yes. Are you familiar with Judith Miller and leading yes. up to the Gulf War? Yes. I didn't see a retraction from the New York Times. Oh, they did a and whole she, evaluation of their news lied, reporting there. She lied. She led this country into that, that news agency and every other supposed legitimate news that led this country into the Gulf War. May I ask what and your so question is with my that, question sir? Is, yes, sir. Back to 62%. Why does anybody believe the so-called legitimate lead? when they don't? Let's let's mention 911. Okay. Where's the legitimate news on that? Okay. Where's the facts? 
So, so with these statistics that we're understanding now, if I may um, try uh, tr to summarize your question, with the statistics that we're looking at now, 62% of folks getting um, their news from social media sources, right? Um, wh wh how do we decide what to believe? Is that fair? Yeah, they're uh, lying to us all the time. You? Yes, sir. All right, and then I'm going to invite our Thank next you. question up. Thank you, sir. I think there is an assumption. I think that that is exactly what we were talking about before. The generalization, the um, you know, the the, the making blanket statements about news or about a publication that in the past you know may have made a mistake uh, may have published something that was wrong and did a retraction that that muddying and I think that's a strategy that you know that that particularly our current administration is falling into the whole throwing the fake news blanket because an organization has made a mistake or has published something that was wrong at one particular point and using that even after a retraction to discredit everything and then what happens is that there's no you know there's no comparison and then you have you know the Alex Jones of the world which grab a little piece of information here and a little piece of that and then make up a line in between and then that is expected to inform our you know our, our populace and, and that is scary one thing uh, coming from the newspaper world uh, originally I spent most of my career working for newspapers before and I, before I joined Capital Public Radio I think there is a, a fair concern about the divide between the editorial page and and the news page and I think the concern is more one of perception it, I don't think that newspapers have always done a great job explaining the divide the fact that you have an editorial staff that writes the editorials um, and then you have news reporters who write unbiased news stories. Um, you know, I think that all media organizations can do a better job explaining how they work, what their process is. We're, we're uh, with our partnership with PolitiFact at, at Capital Public Radio, we're trying to do more of letting people understand how we work. We have three editors sit down to check out each one of our fact checks. They, they go through it, they debate what rating should be placed on there before we ever publish anything. They vote on it, they, they vet it, they ask me to do additional reporting if it's needed, and then we publish. So there's, there's parts of our process that I don't think the general public understands, partly because we don't do a great job explaining it, um, and I think that can lead to some of these maybe misperceptions that um, you know, the opinion and the news side are somehow commingled. And as a citizen, uh, if something is labeled first and foremost as real news, yet doesn't have, uh, say, processes that are transparent, um, that might be a, a good clue for me to mm -hmm. think again, correct? Mm -hmm. If that's the first thing that they're going to tell me about this news, that it's real news. OK, thanks. Um, you mentioned um, the purveyors of fake news, and the examples you used of purveyors of fake news were traditional methods of getting news, uh, print, TV, radio, internet, etc. What about um, um, individuals, uh, particularly individuals in positions of authority and power who make statements like, uh, my inauguration was attended by more people than anybody, uh, repealing Obamacare will not take away anybody's insurance, or um, the tax um, reform um, <clears throat> uh, will help the middle class. What about those individual purveyors of, of uh, false news? Uh, do you consider them fake news as well, individual purveyors rather than institutional purveyors? Well, they're the, the source sometimes of, of the misinformation that people have, right? If we have elected officials or people campaigning for office who are giving information out to the public that's incorrect, clearly that's going to be the source. The job of a good journalist, however, is to point that out. And, and so the news coverage of that statement ought to let us know that it's, it's not to be believed. And so, you know, journalists have a real role to play in letting us know that. And they don't always do it uh, or do it well because of this need to be balanced in your coverage. And if you have an elected official saying something untrue, uh, you're going to be accused of bias if you point out that it's untrue. Mm -hmm. And that's something we need to get past. So what a journalist, I mean, how do you navigate that space? I mean, it's, it, that's what we do. Reporting 
means combating that. I mean, politicians have always exaggerated claims and made false claims. Uh, perhaps in the past, they were less outrageous. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I've, I've, I've been around working in news for about a decade. Um, but I think that that's when, that's when trusting and, and kind of developing an eye uh, as, as a consumer, as somebody who's impacted by, as all of us as individuals, as a member of society, we, we should, instead of falling for the whoever says different is lying, um, we, we should question and we should definitely um, and, you know, gather at least a, you know, a pool of sources that perhaps you know, tend to side with or have slightly different biases because that's true. I mean, organizations will have slightly different biases. You know, the Wall Street Journal leans right, but it's not a fake news site. Um, so you know, having that kind of diversity of, of vetted news sources, I think, is important. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to move away from that. But yeah, reporters, our job is to do that, is to say, mm, wait a minute. And that's why you know, we have the fact checkers of the world now, uh, which are gathering more relevance in, in, the, in the space. It's, it's our job, and, and we should be believed. Um, we shouldn't be questioned just because we're saying something that's unpleasant. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I have two quick questions. So we've all heard about Russia interfering in the US election, and I was curious to know if other countries contributed to that interference and how much interference there is in all the elections in other countries. I personally don't know <laughs> that much about uh, all the other countries and, and what, what their role was. I, I, I guess what, what I do need to know and part of, uh, as I, said earlier, this, this new skill set that I think all journalists need is to dig in and, and really understand where information is coming from. Um, you know, it, it may be that we, we simply need new training to understand, especially if, if something on social media is causing your local community, causing a, a divide, causing opinions um, to, to really concentrate around an idea that came from somewhere else. In that case, we need to call that out. We need to say what the source was. Um, but as far as what, what other countries, I just don't know enough to I say. I think we'll find more out as our uh, investigations are ongoing on the Russian interference with our election, as well as with others. But our intelligence services certainly have pointed to the fact that, that uh, the Russians have attempted to undermine other democracies as well. That it's, it's not just us, it's not about um, even supporting a particular candidate. Uh, it's about sowing discord within democracies and undermining democracy in general. And that's why it's especially insidious and dangerous. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My question's kind of in two parts. I've been trying to formulate it. Um, so do you feel like in this post-truth world that the mainstream legitimate sources of information, the Post, the Times, the Wall Street Journal, NPR, the Huffington Post, um, have recognized that they have contributed to the rise of false news due to the enormous amount of coverage that they so eagerly gave our current president to the detriment of an also awe-inspiring candidate that somehow lacked the same kind of breaking news headlines for some reason, probably because I don't know why. And <laughs> this continues to be a mystery to me. And because of that, they are kind of reaping this uh, allegations of fake news do you feel like they feel that they have contributed to where we have landed and hence a lot of people are turning away from what were once considered legitimate, you know, stalwarts of democracy, protectors of democracy, and now like, I go to BBC. <laughs> So do we feel that, that the, you know, media outlets mentioned are, are recognizing the role that they played um, and feeling the impact of that role? And 
Um, and have they matured? What, what have they done about it? <laughs> I, I haven't seen it happen. I haven't seen those institutions uh, come out enough and, and blame themselves. You know, before the election, I remember, you know, swapping channels and being like, wait a minute, is there only one candidate? Um, and they still are reaping the benefits. I mean, they're still doing the same thing. They're perpetuating that same, you know, uh, a sphere of just reality show, you know, news to a point, especially, you know, on TV everywhere, really. I mean, every news alert I get, there's a high percentage that starts with the word, you know, with, with President news. Trump. Um, and I think that it, it's, I fear for the bar and where it lies now when it comes to who is a good, legitimate candidate. I mean, after, after this much entertainment in, in policy and in tweets and, you know, everything else that surrounds the presidency, I mean, who, who's next? I mean, I, 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 I don't doubt that Kanye West or, you know, The Rock will be considered legitimate candidates. And, you know, how do we reel back from that? I, I'm, I'm not sure. So you don't think the news would reel back from covering them? Like well, they would there really are many journalists that are, and I think this is also kind of like the golden era of nonprofit news that are going in there and of investigative journalism that are showing you, okay, why is something relevant and doing real investigations to bring out you know, corruption or manipulation of, 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 of news or, or, or of the populace too. But the, you know, news organizations are businesses, yeah. Uh, yeah. except for public radio and television, and even they ha you know, need to get money somehow as well, right? Uh, and so it is entertaining. If you think about even the liberals in the crowd probably spent a lot of time reading and hearing about Donald Trump during the election eagerly, right? Because it was fascinating in some way. Um, so so that, that's fed not just from the friends of that point of view, but also from, from both sides. Mm -hmm. I mean, here in California, we experienced that with Schwarzenegger, right? Uh, if you recall 2003, we, people were sort of amazed that, you know, the governor was going to be the governor, and and it happened, and and it wasn't so bad, and we recovered, and you know we we got a lot of attention. Uh, 2003, the debate was on our campus, and we had media from all over the world, not because they were so concerned about California policy, uh, it was because you know the Terminator was gonna you know maybe be governor <laughs> of California, and it worked. Um, but we you know it didn't mean the end of our democracy, and he actually you know turned out to be a more regular sort of governor than you might have expected. So, you know, we can bounce back from these things. So, thank you. That's so comforting. <laughs> yeah. You're saying, yes, thank you for that. And I hear you saying that it's not just the media outlets that are responsible here, but perhaps we have a little responsibility in this oh, of course, as well. Of course we do. If, if you want better journalism on television, watch the news hour more and give to your public television station. They. They, they, it's like they have a gray filter over the camera all the time. And, you know, they don't do all the sensationalism, um, but they do solid, in-depth reporting. You know, we, if we put our money and our eyes and our clicks uh, where our, our intentions are, where our, our higher order thinking is, uh, it will follow. Also, by the way, before I go on, if you still have your pink sheet, I see some people still have the pink sheet. If you could hand them to the outside and we can have people come along the outside just to get the last few of those, that'd be great. Yes, sir. Um, oh, I, I just wanted to jump in if I sorry, could. There, there is one example, uh, and this is maybe a plug for NPR, a little different business model, but I think that NPR did find a way to, to handle this a little bit early in the year. They noticed that uh, certain officials from the Trump administration would come on their air for, for live interviews, and unfortunately they noticed a, a pattern of, of completely false statements from certain officials. They, they stopped doing that. They decided these particular officials, they would tape those interviews. Then they would go fact check them. They would have a reporter uh, essentially prepare the fact check, tape the responses from the officials, and then pair it with the fact check so that the audience could get the full perspective, the, not just the statements, they, they wouldn't ignore what was being said, but a full understanding of the truth. So I think that's one way, perhaps it's a model for others to do it. I think it's, it is difficult when there's a live event, there's this, this desire to cover it, I understand that, but I think uh, there are other ways to do it too. 
And just keeping an eye on the clock here, I don't know that we will have time for more questions than people are standing at the mic. We will try to get to all of your questions here, um, but just in case other folks wanted to join the queue for questions, I think we're probably going to make it through this line at best. Yes, sir. Uh, do you think critical thinking skills are relevant to this problem? Absolutely not. No, I'm sorry. I'm not the panelist here. <laughs> Just trying to bring our mood up a little bit. Critical thinking and I skills. Question, I question, you know, I'm not a parent, but if I were, I would question who is trying to make my kid dumber when they craft policy? I mean, who is behind, you know, defunding education? Who's behind pushing for, for, for disinformation? Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, uh, the, the role of critical thinking. Yeah, I mean, I think education is, is one of the solutions, right? We, we don't do enough sort of just essential civics education in the first place. Most Americans can't even name one branch of government, not to mention three branches of government. Uh, so so the, it's sort of an uphill battle. Um, but critical thinking skills and media literacy skills have to be part of what we engage students with from a very young age. We can't wait until I get them in my class in college, right? We need to start doing this in elementary school and coming up with models for, for teaching them early on how to not be gullible. And fighting that too, I mean, I, I, did, a, I did a story about a student debt that was so shocking and appalling and I was like, you know what, this, this needs to stop. I mean, we, there's a whole system in place that that is, you know, making some people, very few people richer, and it, and it it happens in academic institutions, and it happens in the financial institutions. We have to fight against, you know, that that monster that makes it impossible for people to get a a quality education. So it's not just news, you know. It's it's education needs to be accessible for everybody, so that we can develop those critical thinking skills, and they're not just for the elite, as some like to label people with an education. And I mean, I would, I would push this even a little bit further and to say as someone who, who works in academia and believes that I have pretty fairly well-developed critical thinking skills, mm -hmm. there are still stories that seem so incredible that I shouldn't believe them that turn out to be based on facts, yeah. right? So, <laughs> you know, what, what do we do with that? Um, how, how do we, as folks who are who are engaged or trying to be engaged in the world, even redevelop our critical thinking skills? And I'm wondering, Chris, if you can talk a little bit about that in relation to how journalists may need to be rethinking what they're doing. What do we need to be thinking about? Well, I think um, it's there's no easy answer. It starts with keeping an open mind, uh, which is very difficult. As we've all talked about, we. You know, I think people come into things with, with their own bias. They, they want something to be true. Um, as journalists, we, I mean, I look at our president, uh, uh, it's a Republican president that's demonstrated a clear pattern of making false statements. We need to certainly fact check him. We need to spend a lot of time and effort doing that. He's, he's in power, he's an incredibly influential person, but we can't forget to fact check all other members of other political parties, of Democrats, independents, we need to keep that open mind of just not saying, hey, we're gonna focus on one thing because that's, uh, that's what everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. you know, and that we need to treat news stories that we see in our social media feeds the same way. Say, you know, why am I only thinking about this? What are the other factors at play? And also evaluate our values. I mean, we're seeing a trend now with the Me Too campaign where it's like, you know, you, you decide whether something is right or wrong based on what your party says, and that is a whole lot of bull. Like, you know, whether you're Republican or Democrat, I mean, when Al Franken's story comes out, it's like, well, you know what, that does not cancel out Roger Moore, you know, doing what he did. It doesn't mean that, well, there's perverts in that party too, so, you know, they're worse. No, you're both perverts, and you should both pay for what you did. <laughs> <laughs> and Thank that you, too, of course, there should be, I mean, I think that many of those investigations haven't, from the papers haven't come out until there's, you know, a thorough interview, maybe a few victims, you know, not everybody is, is, public, is publishing the first allegation that comes out, too. Uh, yes, I'm wondering, uh, with the proliferation of 
cable news channels, the 24-hour news cycle, 24-7 that needs to be filled with something, uh, how you think that might be affecting the, the issue of fake news? Thank you. News all the time. <laughs> you know, once upon a time, we didn't have cable TV news. That's true. Uh, hard to imagine. But uh, when it first came on the scene, people thought, this is amazing because previous to that, we had an hour a night or two hours a night or something to, to have news. And now imagine all the stories that can be followed. And we can go into more local stories, more state stories, more, more in-depth coverage of everything. And instead, what we get is, you know, battling, talking heads, yelling at each other. Um, you know, what I'm concerned about is something like, you know, we have the, the cable news uh, outlook is that we have you know Fox on the right and MSNBC on the left and CNN is trying to position itself in the middle but the way they do that is not to have moderate programming but instead to have people crazy on the crazy fringes on the left and right and more moderate and so forth saying outrageous things that get uh, become viral right that's actually the one of the incentives is 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 there a little out, cut out that we can take and make it into something that becomes a, a media sensation outside of the broadcast itself you don't get that from level-headed intelligent uh, you know in-depth reporting when no one says anything crazy so so yes they absolutely have uh, a role to play in, in that but again so do we as consumers Right? If we're tuning into that because we can't wait to see you know, what, what accusations are flung against you know, somebody we don't like, we're enabling that very behavior. And I think one thing that um, also, you know, I experienced when I, going back to cable news, I think more than fake news, what gets impacted is relevance and is our quest for relevance. What is relevant? I invite everybody here to consume local news. I mean, some of you might have seen my promo on ABC 10, which says exactly, you know, lo local news is what matters because the national news is so filled with so much nonsense. You know, it's really just kind of like a game. And I think local news is the first, you know, it's a first level of civic engagement. You know, learning about what's going on in our communities, even though it might not be as sexy as the murder that happened in Florida, because I covered Florida. I mean, there's a Twitter account called Florida Man because Florida is so crazy. Well, that didn't happen here. It doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. It, it's relevant for that family. It's relevant for that community. But the serial killer in Florida, eh, you know. However, you know, the vote that's going through city council here in our community, that is going to impact our lives. And so I think there's definitely an emergence of local news as, hey, we are going to bring you into what really is going to impact you. And maybe, you know, you can still include some national news in your diet because that's relevant. But, you know, the votes that take place here in your community, in your city, are, are definitely more, I guess, you know, crucial um, than what, what's happening nationally. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. My question is future oriented. So with your generation right now, reporters are very aware of fake news and are considering it daily. But with future generations of journalists, as blogging becomes easier to do and there's no fact checking involved necessarily, and subscriptions for newspapers are going down, so funding for invest like full investigative journalists journalism is going down. How do we ensure what's being done, if anything, to ensure that future journalists are more compelled to kind of follow that guideline of ethics and a code where you're involved in telling the truth as opposed to going the easy route and t telling a story full of salation? Thank you. Back <laughs> That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I I don't, I think journalists ha having forums like this is, is a start. Um, you know, at Capital Public Radio, we have a, a pretty strong internship program. I mean, we, we are trying on the local level to, to make a difference. Um, and uh, just a plug for our internship program, we pay our interns. We have high expectations of them. Uh, we bring in uh, young journalists from Sacramento State and around the region. Um, so I think. You know, it, it certainly starts at schools, education, uh, the media literacy programs, which I think there need to be more of. 
Um, and then professional journalists need to talk about what they do, how they do it, and what the, the high expectations are. Um, we're not going to stop people from blogging and from uh, throwing around you know, un unsubstantiated claims, but we can try to call it out and show people who, who really want to get into the profession in a serious way uh, what that pathway is, what it takes. Um, I think, uh, for me, uh, I think what helped personally was I, I started out at small local newspapers, and I, I know that uh, a lot of local papers are having a tough time right now. I think if we support those, that's the start. That's where journalists get their training in large part uh, and then move on to, to larger platforms. If they have a good grounding there, then I think we could see um, some strong, strong work when they elevate themselves to other places. I think we're in a moment of transition with, with the press. Like, like you say, um, a lot of media organizations, traditional media organizations, are losing subscribers and are losing uh, sources of income. You know, Craigslist did great damage to you know the income that newspapers used to get, for example. But what we don't know yet is what the next model will be. One thing that we do know, though, is that there's huge need for it. There's huge hunger. If you talk to practically any, look at all the people who showed up today to talk about this fake news issue. People are, on, on Sunday afternoon before Thanksgiving, you're all here, right? <laughs> and that's because there's a hunger for, for figuring out what's legitimate, for understanding the world, for having it uh, sorted through in a way that we can't personally do because we have busy lives. So the need is there, and when there's a demand for it, there will be, that demand will be filled. And so I, I'm confident that there will be jobs for journalists going forward and we just need to make sure we train them right. Uh, so you should major in government journalism at Sacramento State. <laughs> <laughs> I just completed communication studies through the local colleges and was considering journalism when all this fake news happened and I realized that there's such a demand for fake news that I could never succeed. So I think that in the school system right now, people are being taught that it's important to follow ethics in communications, but we're not seeing that reflected in society, and the professors don't necessarily have the means to combat that right now. So it's thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah. You know, really quickly, I think there is a democratizing effect of, you know, of information and of voices, and I think that's something that's important also to, to notice. Um, you know, I, I went to school for broadcast journalism, and I was taught during a time where, you know, anchors were still the voice of God, and I'm seeing in local news a transition of that. I, I engage directly with the audience. I get Facebook messages. I've picked up a bunch of stories from stories that have been pitched to me. So, I mean, there's definitely a back-and-forth communication, which I think is very powerful and very positive uh, in comparison with kind of like, you know, the magic of television, we don't show the strings, you need to know this because the anchorman says so, as opposed to, no, question me, oh, you know, yeah, you're right, I hadn't thought of that, let me do another story and follow up on that last story. So I think, you know, social media, as much as we're thinking, oh my God, this is so terrible for news, it's also really powerful for engaging all of the voices. We at ABC 10 do a lot of social listening, like right now I have thousands of comments on a story that I'm actively investigating and using those stories to enrich you know, the, the bottom line of this message that we're putting together and it's constantly um, changing. Hi. First of all, uh, I'd just like to say that um, I refuse to see uh, news as a, just a business. I think that uh, like other professions, it should be held to a higher standard. Thank and you. I hope that this, trans this transition will be part of that. Uh, my questions are, uh, first of all, what uh, credibility do you assign to um, uh, anonymous sources and um, the tearing down or mocking of a person's personality? Thank you. Thank you. Anonymous sources. Journalists? Um, okay. I, I think there are other ways of vetting anonymous sources. Um, you know, I personally have not worked on a story where I'm putting something out there uh, that is relevant without checking that whatever, you know, incident is not backed up by public records or like some kind of other record that's not just, you know, a story. Um, I'm personally not doing the kind of reporting right now where 
you know, where I've been able to use a lot of anonymity. And when I have, um, it's, you know, it's through personal accounts, I tend, I always back it up with, you know, some other record of what happened, even if the person wants to remain anonymous for, you know, for their own protection, I'm not just going to put out what they said, but okay, so I'll only use what's backed up by another record in, in my personal reporting. Um, at PolitiFact, uh, we have a policy of just simply not using anonymous sources. Um, the, and again, we're a little bit different breed of, of journalists and practice a tiny bit different breed of journalism. Uh, but essentially, what we do is we have a list with every fact check of every source that we speak with, every report that we go and use to, to back up or knock down a statement that we fact check. Um, it's right there with, with the actual article. Um, as far as traditional journalism, I, I think that anonymous sources can play a huge critical role in stories where you're not going to find out that information otherwise, but journalists have to be extremely, extremely careful, make sure that they back everything up, they do their homework, they investigate where is this person coming from, what are their motivations, and describe as much as possible to the audience um, their relationship to the story. And, and I think you have to do it, uh, you have to be limited about when you choose to do this. Thank you. And do you, I, uh, you didn't, uh, do, you, do you feel that it makes you look professional to tear down or mock a, a newsmaker's personality? Does it make a journalist look professional or? Whoever, could I clarify? Whoever the news is about, the okay. subject. Okay. It, in the news report or in social media? In the news report. <laughs> right. all about news that. report is not professional. In social media, you know, sometimes people do silly things. And just as we allow more access into our own personalities, into our own, you know, who we are as journalists, you'll see a lot of those communications which are not to be taken as this is a piece of news that I'm reporting on, but this is me as a, an individual who happens to be a journalist, you know, interacting with the news around me. Um, that's in my personal kind of, you know, experience. And there's, there's a difference between sort of debate, open debate, and yeah. personal attack, right? right. And, um, personal attack. Right. Yeah. right. By the newscaster. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah, you so much. That shouldn't be. That's, that should, that's not professional, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Somebody to move. Hi. Hi. You've um, addressed a lot of my questions earlier on in terms of critical thinking and the lack of civics emphasis in education, I guess. But if I could observe this audience, I mean, we're all self selected by coming here, but I'm not sure it represents the Sacramento area in the wide demographic idea. And so my question has to do with how do we get um, an informed electorate more broadly spread out there in terms of our responsibility as citizens of this country? There used to be an FCC, I think, requirement about fair and balanced reporting back when there were only three channels, right? I mean, so that's all gone away. All that regulation has gone away. How do we get more people involved in voting and paying attention to this and engaging in critical thinking of what they're seeing? We used to say, consider the source. I don't hear that very often, but we need to consider the source. And how and do we get that into our, our, our communities? I would just like to acknowledge, based on your acknowledgement, that this, the folks on the stage do not also represent the, the, the broader population of, of the Sacramento area. So thank you for, for bringing that to our attention. Uh, that, thoughts? That's why I founded an organization called Project for an Informed Electorate and why we'll never be out of work, mm. right? <laughs> like the, the, there's no end to the need and there's no end to, um, you know, sort of the problems that we encounter in trying to get more people involved. I mean, you know, uh, only about half of American vote, Americans vote even in the big uh, general elections uh, for president, not to mention primaries or off-year elections. Um, and, so, and it's self-selected, like you said, like the people who choose to vote are a particular subset of the, demo, you know, demographic subset of the population. And people who would come to an event like this are even further, you know, selected. Uh, I wish I knew an easy answer to how we get information out to everyone. I think social media or, you know, just digital platforms and, and enable us to get 
information to people on their phones or you know wherever they are if they can't come you know to in person to things um, but you know I mean I wish I would no, I don't wish that we had like chips in people's heads that we could just beam the information in. That seems creepy. But, but short of that, there's not a way to, you know, you can lead a horse to water. Uh, there, there's not a way to, 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 you know, make people take in this information if they're resistant to it. Well, the education point that you made earlier. Though. Right. And I mean, one of the things that as much as I said, you know, news is not supposed to be fun. Um, you know, we, especially as a video journalist, I try to talk to my generation which does not watch local news. Um, and I do so in a certain format of clips that I put out there. And, um, you know, I think when we put together stories, not from these are, you know, these, this is the issue or these are the facts or this is what happened, but from why does it matter? And as journalists, you know, we're supposed to, and we learn to ask the right questions and the right questions go along those lines of, yeah, but why? And why does it matter? And who does it matter to? And, you know, the stories that I try to do are generally the, the answer of who does it matter to is, you know, as many people as possible, and then why? Um, you know, an example of that, I recently did a story about housing, and I covered this movement called, you know, the Yimbies, Yes in My Backyard. And um, it's, a, it's a very unlikely group because, they're generally, you know, young people, a lot of them in the Bay Area, who had no idea about, you know, why they pay such high rents. And the reason for that is because the laws that are passed when it comes to housing are passed by, a, you know, a certain segment of the population that doesn't generally represent them because they don't go to, you know, a, a city council and um, planning commission meetings and that kind of thing. And what they've done is really impressive. As kind of like a, you know, a movement, a party, is they get into issues that are not generally part of what their generation is talking about and kind of dissect it in a way for people like them and branding and whatever you know, to, to be attracted to and, to and to go and understand and vote on. Um, and the same thing with news. You know, what we do, my form, I came from, I, I was working independently, but I was freelancing for Vice. And I learned a lot of the things that millennials want to watch when they you know, watch stories. And and so in, in putting stories together, it's do they want to hear me change my voice? Do they want to see me like in a dress in the middle of the fire? Probably not. You know, they're looking for who is this person is as real as I am. And I wanted to see that person tell me why this matters, not tell me, but, you know, figure out why it matters and, you know, put it in a story. So I think there's a lot of that transition happening, too, where it's sometimes people who are uninterested can be brought in by speaking their language. Yeah, there's academic research that shows that uh, media stories that frame it in that way, uh, what does it mean, what does this mean to you, uh, are much more engaging. You actually end up getting people expressing interest in stories like that. You know, so if the, if the story is, you know, the, the Senate is considering H.R. 1512, <laughs> boring, right? Like nobody's interested. But if it's this, what, what's this bill going to mean to you if it passes? Here, here are the implications and suddenly you're like, oh my gosh, you know, what does this mean? Uh, so it's about framing of the stories as well. And, and journalists are getting so much better at that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. How do you make sure that you cover the breadth of the news that is out there and that you don't find yourself um, suddenly gravitating towards the really, the really um, dramatic news at the expense of something quiet that's going on that might turn out to be much more important? Well, I would say that that's a daily challenge. One thing that we've started at Capital Public Radio, which, which ties into the last question as well, is we, we've hired a community engagement uh, specialist. It's a uh, full-time position. Um, doesn't necessarily produce the stories, but connects with uh, the population across Sacramento to not just let them know about our stories, but to track them and, and how what impact the stories are having on people. We just finished a, um, a long series of um, essentially a documentary on affordable housing in the Sacramento area. And once we finished with the subjects of that story, um, we, we continue to track them and see what how the policies that we reported on are impacting their lives. Um, but that, that took a long time. That's not always in the headlines, all the regulations and challenges of, of getting a fair rent. But we, we spent a lot of time on it. I think in, in public radio, 
Uh, we do look at things maybe slightly differently. We, again, have a slightly different business model. Um, it's a real challenge for some of the, the companies, uh, the media companies that are losing money, uh, that don't have very many reporters to, well, to was, go to all these government meetings and cover what might be considered minutia. Um, net neutrality and the tax bill, to name two things, which are both quite important, if I'm reading correctly. And there's not a lot of coverage of either one of them. And there are other things as well, obviously. I think you need to have, um, I mean, as organizations, ABC 10, where I work right now, um, we don't fall for what, you know, or at least in our storytelling, we don't go for what they call, you know, commodity news. We don't tell stories out of a press release that was sent to us by, you know, the usual people who send press releases and where all the other local stations run and cover the story. Uh, we try to find, you know, meaning and, and relevance and, and why is something relevant. Me personally and our whole enterprise team, which is made up of four reporters right now, you know, we, we, tr we fight the whole you know, attention deficit in, in news, you know, issue that so many other um, stations or, or cable channels, et cetera, fall for, which is what's happening right now, today, 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 today. We spend a lot of time digging and getting into a story and even developing uh, a specialization of sorts in that issue, you know, housing being one of mine and homelessness and, you know, uh, uh, gender equality, there, there are issues that I'm passionate about personally. And so, you know, another reporter, John Bartell, is going to be more interested in stories about or, you know, animals. And, and he'll go down that route and follow up and do more stories. And we do have, you know, daily reporters that go out there and cover, you know, what happened today, usually with a different angle and usually figuring out how does this matter, why does this matter to people. But, um, I try not to shy away from a topic that's not initially sexy. You know, housing for me is such a good example because I was like, this is so boring. This is horrible until I understood why my rent is so high <laughs> um, as an individual. And then as a reporter, I kept digging and digging and digging. And, and, you know, I think more and more you're seeing reporters like Liam Dillon at the LA Times who only wants to focus on housing. Um, I just worked with another reporter at the LA Times too in Mexico who only specializes on you know, earthquakes. And so I think that there is, there is definitely a call in news organizations for people to follow just you know one line of reporting and become an expert at it and bring it to all of us and bring why it's relevant, not just like the everyday craziness of the, what's in the news cycle. There was this really nice, um, very comprehensive study of local TV news uh, a couple of years ago that some people from Pew did. And what they found is that the, though the news directors of the local TV news stations had this feel for what people wanted to see. They thought, you know, the sensational stories about fire and crime and, you know, the things that the news directors tend to put at the top of the broadcast. Um, that the reality was, when you did a full analysis, that the, new, the local TV news stations across the country that got the best ratings in their markets were the ones that did enterprise reporting, that, that actually had more sourcing, that went into more detail and didn't use that sort of sensationalist model in their reporting. And, and the thing is, people, people actually like to eat their vegetables sometimes. You know, like we have the sense that, you know, we, we'll go for, for, for the flashy, um, jingly thing right off the bat. But, but actually, you know, there, we like complex television. If you think about the evolution of television over time, it used to be one story that was linear, and now we have multiple plot lines that go over the arc of multiple seasons, and we love it. People like complex video games. People enjoy puzzles. People enjoy thinking. And we enjoy understanding complex media stories, too, if we're given access to it. It's sort of like, you know, if, if you were only given Kraft mac and cheese your whole life, and I, put, I said, here's some mac and cheese that was a, a delicious truffle, multi-cheese mm, mac and cheese, um, you might initially say, oh, I don't want that. I'm used to the Kraft. That doesn't, you know, it's not the right shade of orange for me. But if you are given enough opportunities to experience the good stuff, you'll eventually have a preference for the good stuff. We just need more reporting that gives us high quality content and, and we'll go that way. The success of podcasts is such a good example of that. Yeah. Who knew, right? right? You know, that people are going to sit for 40 minutes just listening when we have so much 
exciting, you know, uh, attractive things happening in front of our eyes. Who, th who knew that radio was going to have this, you know, golden age now with podcasts? And, and yeah, people want to stay tuned if the storytelling's good. Thank you. And before we wrap things up here, I'm going to take it back to mac and cheese for just a second, or more specifically, most of us are going to be spending time with family um, over the next week. And we may not agree with all of those family members um, with whom we'll be spending our time and having discussions over perhaps mac and cheese and all of the things we like to eat this time of year. Um, any advice from our panelists in terms of what can we think about um, in the conversations that, that might be ahead specifically if either the subject of fake news comes up or if people are um, talking about news that we believe to not be true? Um, how, any thoughts on how you might go about addressing um, these moments of conversation or anything that we can, that we can think about as we um, leave the space today? I recommend the Socratic method, uh, where <laughs> in, instead of saying, no, that's wrong, that's fake news, that, that'll put people's hackles up and make them reject whatever you're about to say. Instead, ask them, so what makes you believe that? Uh, and, and dig a little bit deeper and start to understand what the maybe emotional motivation might be for a person to want to believe a certain thing and have a personal conversation, especially if it's a family, it's your long lost aunt that you, know, you love dearly. Um, you know, have a conversation with her about what her values are and what your shared values are and, and what, you act, you know, what leads you to believe what you believe. And you might actually bridge that gap a little bit um, in a way that saying that's fake news and run, storming out of the room won't work. Yeah. I'm going to write that down. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't do that. What not to do? It's for my uncle. Excellent. Yeah. I, I hate to uh, steal somebody's answer or, you know, or repeat something, but it's so true. You know, I think that with my family, my family comes from, I, I grew up in Puerto Rico, and, you know, my family's made up of highly political, you know, kind of like fierce, politically passionate people in the politics in the island. Um, and, you know, I learned early on that it's the, the most important thing you can say is why, not, you know, you're a racist. No, why, 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 until you start understanding and, and as Kim said, just bridging that, I think it's crucial. Um, you know, my boyfriend's family with whom I tend to spend Thanksgiving is, is super conservative and I come from, you know, very liberal family in Puerto Rico and so I, I always try to understand why why does somebody feel that way? Why does somebody think that? And I've come to learn so much mm. that I didn't know. And I didn't re even realize that what I thought was right is, you know, has, has a reason that's either in my DNA or in my culture um, or in what I was taught at the dinner table. So yeah, why is such a crucial thing to ask mm -hmm. or say? <laughs> yeah, I think my approach is, um as a reporter, as when I go sit down at Thanksgiving table, I mean, I can learn something from everyone. You know, I don't have to agree with them, but I, you know, if I, if I just throw something out there and, and, you know, you're kind of a flamethrower, you're not going to really get that interaction where you have a chance to learn. Why not take that chance to, to really see where someone's coming from? Uh, you might uh, slightly change your perspective on it. Um, I think just, not just at the, at the table, but, but, across society we need a little more civility we need um, to stop and and realize we're all human beings we can again uh, be you know maybe disagree without being disagreeable and um, and you know don't don't shut off that avenue of learning I'd like to thank our panelists here Chris Nichols please give a round of applause for our panelists <laughs> Lilia Luciano thank you Thank you for joining us today. And Professor Kim Nalder, thank you very much for joining us today. And before I hand it over to our friends at the library, would you please just give the big reveal? Yes. What's real, what's not okay, so real? Okay, so, so each of you evaluated four different stories uh, in different order, right? So you didn't have the same order of stories. Um, the true stories. Uh, Hillary Clinton did indeed win the popular vote in 2016. That was a true story. And the story about Trump's recent overseas visit was also a true story. Uh, the one where Kellyanne Conway says, don't hate me because I'm beautiful, was false. 
And the Roy Moore story uh, was also false. So thank you for participating in that survey. We'll let you know uh, if you check the website for Pi in, gosh, six weeks or something, we ought to have a, a nice write-up of, of what the preliminary results are from the survey, uh, if you're interested in that. And a big thank you from all of us to Sacramento Public Library. Thank you.